When it comes to endurance races, they don't get any tougher than the Le Mans 24 hour race. And this Bentley behind me won the 2003 running of the Le Mans 24 hour race. We're here to get some insight into a few of the technical aspects of the car. Now, the basis of the car is a 4 litre V8. Interestingly enough, it is a direct injected V8. While nothing uncommon these days, this is relatively new technology for 2003 being applied in the motorsport arena. And one of the reasons the direct injection was used was to try and gain a fuel economy advantage. In endurance racing power certainly isn't everything and getting an economy advantage that could perhaps allow the car to complete one more lap was considered significant. In this case the car could only complete around about 14 laps of Le Mans before needing to be refueled so understandably any fuel economy advantage was significant. Another aspect with these cars is that they were restricted to maintain some sort of power parity. This was achieved in two ways. First of all the engine had to breathe through a pair of 34mm restrictors. These are placed on the inlet to the turbocharger, basically strangling the airflow and limiting the maximum power that could be produced. The other aspect that was controlled for power parity was the boost pressure limit. Now this is not uncommon and in this case the car was allowed to run up to 1.8 bar of pressure absolute. Essentially what this means is 0.8 bar of positive pressure boost pressure above atmospheric pressure. Now of course if the teams exceeded that limit they were disqualified or at least penalised. So it's a case of treading a very fine line, trying to make as much boost as possible right up to that pressure limit. Now conventionally boost control, even with a sophisticated closed loop control system, can be a little bit tricky. So the team here decided to take a slightly different approach and they're actually using an onboard compressor. This provides a pressurised reservoir of air which was then fed to the top of the wastegate and instead of directly controlling boost pressure in the inlet manifold the ECU was maintaining a specific pressure in the top of the wastegate. As a result this affects the boost pressure in the inlet manifold and because they're starting with a regulated supply of pressure that they can supply to the wastegate head this means that it's possible to maintain much more accurate control of boost. So with that 1.8 bar absolute pressure target, they were able to run up to about 1.79 bar, treading very close to the line without exceeding it. While the engine used direct injection, which as we've said was relatively new for the era in competition, it did still retain a cable drive throttle body system. Now, particularly because this uses dual plenums with dual throttle bodies, this makes it a little bit more complex to uh, attach the driver's foot pedal up to the dual throttles. What happens here is that the driver's throttle pedal is attached to a central bell crank mounted at the rear of the engine. This then feeds off to the two throttle bodies, allowing the throttle bodies to be actuated and matched to each other. Now, an interesting aspect with this system as well is because of the paddle shifted gearbox, this also allows a new pneumatic throttle blip to be actuated in order to match revs on the downshift. The little throttle blipper is part of the bell crank arrangement at the rear of the engine. Another interesting aspect of this car is that it used a telemetry system that was essentially completely separate from the engine control unit. This meant that the two systems worked independently of each other and meant that if the telemetry system gave any problems this wasn't going to affect the operation of the engine and vice versa. These days we're more likely to see an integrated electronics package with all of the control, data logging and telemetry configured and controlled from one single unit. Another interesting aspect with this car is the aerodynamic package fitted to it. Obviously aerodynamics and downforce are critical to lap speed and in this case the car only weighed 900 kgs yet at 150 mile an hour the car produces an insane 2,200 kilograms of downforce. With a top speed of 212 mile an hour we can only guess at what the sort of downforce was at top speed. If you like that video, make sure you give it a thumbs up and if you're not already a subscriber, make sure you're subscribed. We release a new video every week. And if you like free stuff, we've got a great deal for you. Click the link in the description to claim your free spot to our next live lesson.